of micro learning once again, uh, this time with Kate from Seven Taps, which is very exciting. Um, so first of all, thank you for taking the time out to uh, join us. And um, as is kind of becoming my catchphrase, I'll get out of the way and um, hand over the screen to you. Thank you so much, Tom, for such an intro and thanks for having me here. Hey, everyone, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And uh, I've already um, seen lots of familiar names in the chat. So, hey, everyone. Um, and today we're going to talk about microlearning examples and how to use them right away. First of all, just a quick intro for uh, people who are not familiar with me or Seven Tabs. Um, I'm an L&D professional with a marketing background. Previously, I worked for an L&D consulting company, and now I'm a very passionate business owner. And Seven Tabs takes most of my time and energy. I guess this good boy on the second picture would love to get the same attention, but uh, currently I'm all in my work. Um, as you can also uh, see from the picture, I'm a fan of Tim Slade's book. Uh, let me know if you are uh, in their community too. And yeah, hey, Mike. Um, before we start, I'd love to make uh, just a quick uh, note um, that I'm not a professional public speaker. And uh, probably you will notice that I like some skills in this field, but um, I have a great background in the L&D and thanks for the experience of building my own tool, Seven Times Microlearning, that has recently reached the number one spot for microlearning platforms and is used by already 7,000 clients all over the world. I have lots of examples to share with you, so just forgive me if um, this session won't be as interactive as you like it to be and um, if you have any suggestions on how i could improve my presentations and you leave a more value to you just let me know i'm happy to um, and i'm open to take this feedback and um, also uh, i know that just uh, for the sake of engagement i should look directly in the camera eye but frankly for me it's a bit discomfort uh, so uh, i'll try to do my best but forgive me if i won't look uh, right it's you. So let's go. Uh, first of all, I'd love to um, uh, get some information about your experience with MicroLearn. And um, if you are okay with that, please put in the chat one if you have never created any MicroLearning assets, um, put two if you uh, know a few tricks, and uh, put three if you can call yourself as a proficient creator. I hope there are more than three folks uh, in this session. <laughs> thanks, Linda, for joining in. Uh, thanks, Stefan. And by the way, uh, during this presentation, I will try to keep my eye on uh, the chat. And uh, if I uh, understand how my answers would fit in my presentation naturally, I will answer them right away. So feel free to post your questions. I will um, uh, take an eye on that. So more twos. Oh, we have one proficient creator here. <laughs> Camille is uh, not sure whether uh, their experience might be uh, as a kind of a beginner magician or a proficient creator. Hello, hello. So yeah, I, I, I guess I um, have an understanding. We have a range variety of experts here, so I'll try to be uh, available for all of you. And um, I suggest we start with the definition of microlearning. And I know that you're all fed up with the concepts like it's a bite-sized learning or you should deliver some learning chunks because the internet is flooded with such kind of articles. But for me, um, having a good uh, definition uh, means that you have some practical basis of how you should proceed with the implementation of this approach. And um, I prefer um, turning to the great definition um, put together by Carol Cobb and Robin DeFelice in their book, Microlearning Short and Sweet. Actually, that's the number one resource I always recommend for any microlearning enthusiast. 
a very practical guide on how you could embrace this approach. So according to Carol Kopp and Robin DeFelis, uh, microlearning is an instructional unit that provides a short engagement in an activity intentionally designed to elicit a specific outcome from the participant. And let's dive deeper into the elements of this definition. First of all, instructional unit. It can be a learning activity, it can be a video, it can be a text message or a job aid, or it can be a seven tabs piece. Just think of one entire piece of instruction that stands by itself. Then short engagement. Actually, that's a challenging uh, point because microlearning experience is not meant to last beyond a few minutes. And um, naturally, different learning or performance needs require different lengths of time. And I'm not a fan of um, standing that you should just limit your asset with one minute and no longer. Personally, I um, stick to the stick to the take that the shorter the better and far more likely to be read, understood, and applied. But again, it all depends on the context you are aiming at, and uh, it depends on your learning objective. Sometimes you can allow yourself to um, even deliver ten minute byte, and it still be a micro learning asset. Sometimes you will have only thirty seconds to help your employee, to help your participant to overcome the business challenge. And also, without some type of engagement, the value of micro learning is lost. And I'm not here talking about um, some fun activities, and I'm not advocating for more interactivity and more gamification. Definitely not, because, you know, micro learning is often used um, somewhere closer to the moment of performance, right? So your instruction may be less interactive. Just imagine the concept. Your learner um, is looking for some quick instruction on how to deal with their urgent situation. And what they need, they need to grasp the concept and they need to get back to their work immediately, already equipped with new skill or knowledge, right? So in most cases, they won't have time to match some visuals together or to drag in the missing words. And um, as a source of quick engagement, I personally prefer uh, to use quizzes to make learners formulate their own conclusions through answering some short and targeted questions. Um, next, specific outcome. I guess I won't uh, reinvent the wheel here by saying that microlearning assets should help to facilitate a specific outcome. And in most cases, it will be one learning objective per nugget. Uh, sometimes there are situations that there could be two objectives. For example, you uh, deliver some byte on a new product feature and within the same byte, you um, train your salespeople on how to talk about this feature with uh, clients. And again, we see it. Uh, here is uh, an objective just to uh, create an awareness of this new feature. And you put some very simple skill inside uh, about presenting this feature to clients. But um, it's better to uh, think of one learning objective always. Further, uh, we'll be talking about microlearning use cases and we'll take a closer look at this point. Then let's proceed. Intentional design. And one of the worst microlearning examples I stumbled upon um, was when a company tried to um, kind of a squeezing an hour long conventional course into a series of five minute chunks. And why this is a disaster? Um, when you do this, the outcomes of your one hour course are still in place, right? And a true microlearning piece 
have only one outcome per nugget. And what I'm leading to here is that the process of designing microlearning uh, must be intentional. Otherwise, the desired outcome simply may not be achieved. Then specific participant. You know, um, calling this person a participant, I don't mean just demographics or uh, people experience. I mean also the context this person is, right? Uh, for example, think of what circumstances um, surround your learner when they will turn to this particular piece of content. Um, you know, it's absolutely crucial for a microlearner to be aware of this context because only understanding the context you might deliver something really practicable, something that can be consumed and something your learner can benefit from. Thus, we are moving to the next part of my presentation. And first of all, um, microlearning should be applied reasonably. It's definitely not a magic bullet and it should be a part of your learning strategy. Good learning is always blend of experiences. However, engaging your micro learning assets um, may be, they won't replace um, just some conventional learning experiences. It's simply not possible to expect one single method to meet every instructional need. And um, here's a bad example I faced several times when there is a kind of a micro learning enthusiast in the company and uh, they drive uh, the deployment, the implementation of um, the micro learning approach. And usually this person is very passionate about micro learning and gradually they convert all existing learning assets into micro ones. And the strategy is definitely not a smart one. Micro learning also is not a magic bullet for retention all by itself. But when you deliver some spaced micro learning assets and use them to reinforce the training session, it's a smart choice. Then here on the slide, uh, you can see micro learning use cases depending on their learning objective. I intentionally put here that they are powered by seven tabs. This is the data I get from seven tabs clients and I know for sure from experience that these scenarios are perfect for micro learning. Companies really benefit from that. And further, we'll just dive deeper into some of the use cases. I'll share some good and bad examples so you can make your own conclusions on that. First of all, uh, using microlearning to reinforce an event. That's actually a pretty simple and common scenario for microlearning. And um, you can enhance your existing training, you can enhance your webinar, or you can even enhance your instructor-led experience or facilitation session with some follow-ups and reminders. Or you can create some warm-ups to uh, prepare your learners before a training session. It actually works great when there is a variety of knowledge levels among your participants. Or you can always refresh some knowledge that were delivered previously by delivering a five-minute extract. And I guess there is no need for me just to explain to you that learners need to be convinced. They uh, they need to be uh, instantly reminded to use their new skills and knowledge, right? So in most cases, this use case um, um, doesn't uh, provide any difficulties for learning leaders. Uh, and I have only one bad example to share with you here uh, from my personal experience. Once I participated in a day-long workshop and um, after it, um, the organizers shared with me uh, the follow-up. And when I opened it, I realized that uh, they simply, I don't know how they managed to do that, but they squeezed in uh, almost the script of the day into one long PDF file. And 
uh, I uh, was looking for some visual associations to share with you. And uh, I guess I felt as if I were the golden retriever uh, on this photo. So don't do that. Don't try to squeeze in everything. Follow up and reminder is a very short and targeted extract of the main information you delivered previously. Then uh, using microlearning to introduce a skill. And the main point here is that you should introduce a very simple skill. A good example um, is when you create some microlearning asset for your sales team on how to handle one particular customer objection. This is a very small and descript concept you can aim at. Um, or you just think of presenting uh, a skill of how to deal with new software or how to fulfill uh, one particular job task using this new corporate software. So you see, that's something very small and discreet. And it works great also with the so-called refreshing training. A good example here. My brother, uh, my older brother, used to work as a sales rep for a pharmaceutical company. And uh, of course, they had regular training. It was great. Uh, but I remember that my brother um, would create some um, kind of a cheat sheets uh, that he used to refresh his knowledge before the appointment with the doctor. I mean, when he sat uh, somewhere in the healthcare facility, uh, just waiting for this appointment. And um, now thinking about it, I understand that those handmade cheat sheets um, should have been provided by the l &D department, right? And just thinking about the context, um, we understand that our learner resort to this type of content to refresh something. Um, they don't need to, to, to go through the 30 minute long webinar. They need just the extra of information they could just uh, recall and uh, finally uh, put into practice during the upcoming meeting. Um, but a bad example here is when you try to force someone to go through a microlearning course that was originally designed for a longer and more in-depth format. That's definitely a recipe for disaster. And um, one bad example from my experience, uh, just recently I decided to take a course on copywriting for instructional design. And um, I should say that I respect uh, the author a lot and I was all willing to uh, take this course and uh, I had no idea about the way they would deliver this course. So I purchased it. And um, despite my huge interest in the subject and despite my uh, sincere willingness to consume this information, I was not able to do it. The reason? they just um, cut the, it seems to me, they just cut kind of a one hour long video course into, I don't know, um, perhaps 20 short video nuggets. And for me, it was like that experience was torn into pieces. Uh, between those uh, video nuggets, there were some quizzes and very primitive interactions that actually annoyed me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I got so annoyed with it just on, 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 on minute 10, I guess. So uh, when looking for the visual that would um, kind of uh, um, remind you of this bad example, I thought of uh, this dollar picture because two halves still equal a dollar. And actually you can exchange for the, uh, for the new bill now, right? But it doesn't feel right. So make sure that the concept you want to deliver can be realistically broken into some standalone pieces. Now let's proceed. Performance support. 
or using microlearning to support a job task. I'd say, first of all, that this case is when microlearning shows all its beauty. It's enabling. Uh, what you do here, you just use microlearning assets to help your participant to do the job itself right at the moment of need. And speaking about the moment of need, I should refer to the Gottfriedson and Moshe's research on when someone at work needs learning materials. That's a solid and uh, thought-provoking framework, highly recommended. So Gottfriedson and Moshe say that training is needed for moments one and two, while support materials are more appropriate for moments three, four, and five. Deliver something extremely specific. Personally, I prefer to call such learning nuggets as how-tos. That's something practical behind this short word for me. And let's get back to the example. I have a bad example to share with you here. Actually, that's a story uh, of a good friend of mine. She once faced some unexperienced problem with their corporate software when she was talking to uh, an angry customer. So the situation was actually intense and she managed to access their corporate library and she managed even to find the appropriate piece of content about how to deal with this uh, issue and she opened it and just in a second she realized that it's absolutely useless for her. The reason that microlearning asset was so excessively interactive that she just understood that it would take too much time for her to go through the uh, puzzles and quizzes and uh, inbuilt games. And uh, I reached out to her uh, yesterday asking for some great visuals uh, to describe her feelings, her emotions, and that situation. And she shared this uh, picture childish maze and that was exactly how she felt when she was all alone with her problem having that microlearning asset in front of her so you see I'm pretty sure that that was not a plan of their L&D department they they were striving to to do their best they designed a great asset but when we consider the context in which the learner resort to that particular content, it was just poorly reflecting the surrounding, the environment. So make sure that your learning asset fits the real world, the real life. And one more reason I, I really love uh, performance support with microlearning is that, you know, our learners actually were not hired for coming through some learning pieces. They were hired to deliver some job. They were hired to uh, deliver some operational duties, right? And that will be always their first priority. Learning will come second in most cases. So think of making your learning assets enabling. That's why we actually uh, all are here. That's why L&D industry exists. We try to enable our learners with some materials to, to help them perform better, right? And to earn more money for a company. Then the next use case is when you prototype e-learning. Actually, uh, that's also one of my favorite use cases, and unfortunately, it's the one that uh, people do not talk uh, a lot uh, about. Uh, so you can use microlearning to uh, prototype some conventional e-learning modules. Don't dive into, I don't know, designing a long, full-fledged um, learning asset. Start with something small, present it to stakeholders or I don't know, even run an experiment with your learners, get feedback, and thus you can come up with something really valuable and outstanding 
as a next step. My career assets definitely serve you well here. Um, there is only one challenge uh, you may face on this path is that um, pretty typing content means you should produce content really quickly. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense, right? And to make a really good impression and to get at least fair results of your experiment, your prototype should look at least visually appealing, right? And not every tool provides you with such capabilities. Um, that's why I, while preparing to this presentation, uh, created a very short and super quick prototype, uh, kind of a reminder of this presentation in seven tabs. You can see the uh, QR code right on your screen and you can take your smartphone and scan it. And thus, you'll get a quick reminder of what I've delivered previously. I hope that you will enjoy it. Also, I have a link that I can share with those who are not familiar with scanning process. I hope that Tom will help me with putting this link in the chat. And yeah, what I'd love to deliver next is to make a kind of an announcement about a microlearning conference. Um, I hope that it won't sound like a sales pitch. Um, this is a place that will be of a huge interest for all the microlearning enthusiasts. Uh, we will bring together some of the biggest names in the L&D uh, to spill the beans on how they use microlearning as part of their training strategies. And, uh, on the upcoming episode on February 24, uh, we'll talk about how to run a microlearning pilot to get buy-in within your organization. We will talk about um, developing module-based training like HubSpot. And um, amazing Karen North will share her experience on using microlearning for performance support. And we'll bring joy, uh, tons of uh, surprises and digital magic and hands-on experience if you simply bring yourself. All are welcome. It's free. And uh, I'm really looking forward to see you all there. And uh, one more announcement for microlearning folks that are willing to uh, get a deeper understanding of how they could embrace and benefit from this approach. Um, uh, currently, uh, my company and I personally are running a ticket giveaway for a three-week research-based microlearning course led by amazing microlearning professional Robin DeFelis. Uh, if you uh, haven't read microlearning short and sweet book, you should definitely read it. It's a great resource. And all you can, uh, all you should do just to get a free ticket is to create a short seven tabs, just no more than three cards about why you'd love to uh, participate in this training. Share it on LinkedIn and uh, on February 15, I will uh, pick the eight winners. Perhaps there will be more if uh, I will be all enthusiastic about uh, entries. So. Yeah, feel free to join. Uh, that will be a great training. I uh, visited one of her uh, courses previously and I really enjoyed the atmosphere. I just even, I can't even put into words how, uh, how engaging and how practical, how practical uh, it was. So uh, having said that, I will wrap up and um, share some time for answering your questions. Um, this is my LinkedIn profile. Uh, feel free to connect. And um, if you have any ideas for me to enhance my presentations and if you can share some skills on public speaking, I'm definitely open to that. Um, feel free to connect. I'm happy to, I'm happy to chat with you. That's all, Tom. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for putting the link in the chat. Awesome. No, I think that was fantastic. Um, so guys, if you've got questions, now is the time. Um, it's the lunch break after this, so don't worry. Biscuits soon, if you were clever enough to buy biscuits ahead of time like I did. Um, 
but no, you can't have any of mine. Um, let's jump into the question we already have, which I think is a great question. Uh, let me just move us out of the way. Uh, from Morgan, how to decide when micro learning is the right way to go? Is it just a balance between focus and just in time? That's a great question, Morgan. And uh, actually, I'm not a fan of just trying to introduce micro learning because it's something trendy or you you should introduce it to your organization. Um, I, I, I try to uh, start with um, running kind of a needs assessment. And when I understand that I can deliver uh, this particular knowledge and I can uh, train this particular simple skill with some micro learning asset, I don't need I don't need actually a full-fledged e-learning module on that, then go micro. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense when you just try to kind of a, think of some opportunities you might come up with. When um, I talk to our clients, in most cases, they all start with some learning re-enhancement and thus they gradually uh, see how micro learning work and they see how their learners um, response to this uh, kind of training reinforcement and thus learning leaders uh, find new opportunities to run uh, this approach, right? So start with just some warm-ups, follow-ups, reminders, or try to deliver some quick updates on new information, just putting some practical value inside. And I guess uh, you will simply uh, have a bigger picture of the microlearning opportunities in your organization. Awesome answer. Uh, I think that was fantastic. Um, uh, just checking. Uh, the I, I, I mean, the, the, the perception seems to be um, that everyone was very impressed with your presentation. <laughs> um, so I think you did a fantastic job. Um, let's have a look. Um, oh, here we go. This this was going to be my question. Um, so what was your inspiration, trigger or light bulb moment that you decided I need to create seven taps? That's a fantastic question. Thank you so much for bringing that. Actually, I'm a huge fan of simple yet powerful products. And I saw how our clients, when I was in the ELD consulting company, I saw how our clients struggled with complicated e-learning platforms and having a marketing background and um, uh, having lots of great simple products on my tool set, I was always thinking like, oh, our L&D industry should be just like, you know, leading when we use great products because we deliver some knowledge. We, we, we should be, uh, first of all, uh, and pff, all we have are clumsy products that take time, efforts and nerves and, um, they most uh, provide you with really high barriers to start uh, creating something at least basic. So I was thinking about some very rapid and effortless and fun authoring tool that would be engaging for all the parties involved. I mean, creators and learners. And I once I had a, an idea of why people are so obsessed with stories, actually, uh, there's a great background behind that because story is a nice way to put some information, to deliver it quickly, and you don't need to explain people how to interact with such content. We're all familiar with this kind of content. And as for the creators, they don't need to kind of uh, pass any onboarding or to uh, watch, I don't know, three hour long courses on how to start using the tool. They they don't need any technical background. And as for learners, they don't even perceive this kind of content as learning event. You know, some, some, uh, some of the most uh, exciting feedback I got from learners was that uh, when they've already um, uh, finished, completed the course, it was like, and when will the learning begin? So they had no idea that they were learning. It was so native, organic, and natural for them. So they mainly had some uh, great experience and fun. So that's all about I wanted to deliver with seven taps. Fantastic. And I think it's uh, mission accomplished on that front. Um, it's, a, it's a really fantastic tool. Great. Um, so 
unless anyone has any very, very last minute um, questions uh, or things they would like to uh, to say, uh, I'm going to drop the link that you shared with me earlier that I didn't notice. My apologies into the uh, <laughs> into the uh, chat there. Um, and you can go and check that out. Um, but as I mentioned before, it is time for our our break. Um, that was lesson learned number one from uh, last year's event. Do allow for lunch breaks. Um, if not for you guys, then just for myself. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're back at um, 2.45 UK time. Um, so just over an hour where we'll be looking at consultative frameworks. We've also got uh, machine learning translation and building leadership and development frameworks this afternoon. So loads more exciting stuff. Um, do make use of the networking areas and the sessions. And of course, um, if you want to get in touch with any of our speakers, their details are there. Um, and yes, there we are. The uh, the hashtag of the day from uh, from from Jonathan Rock there uh, hashtag biscuits now um, <laughs> we made it to biscuit time people so again thank you all very much and we shall see you later today bye bye